Welcome. Welcome to Acts of Magis. This is one way the Loyola Schools tries to celebrate grace. Grace, even in the face of adversity. I'd like to thank the Loyola Schools faculty members who are going to do their presentations. They are commendable in their own excellence, expertise, and passion for the common good. I'd also like to thank the University Research Council and the Ateneo Research Institute of Science and Engineering for collaborating in organizing this event. So welcome again, go with hope and courage. Dr. Emma E. Borio is the Professor Emeritus and past chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and Science Research Fellow of the Manila Observatory. She received her PhD in Sociology from the University of Hawaii and taught its Gender Studies program. She has spent years doing research on climate and disaster risks in relation to social, cultural vulnerability, urban poverty, risk governance, and community well-being and resilience. During the past two decades, Dr. Porio has brought Philippine sociology to the global stage. With her publications and leadership in various local and international organizations, such as the Philippine Sociological Society, the Philippine Social Science Council, the International Sociological Association, and five other international sociological and social science associations. Thus, in 2012, her work on vulnerability, adaptation and resilience to floods and climate change related risks among marginal riverine communities in Metro Manila was awarded outstanding scholarly work with the most social impact by the Ateneo de Manila University. While her work on climate adaptation in Metro Manila was recognized for its outstanding social science contribution to understanding climate change by the International Sociological Association during the ISA Vienna Forum in 2016. Currently, she is the president of the Clinical or Applied Sociology Division of the International Sociological Association. Dr. Porio is also the project leader and principal investigator of the Inter- and Transdisciplinary Action Research Project, Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines, Investing in Climate and Disaster Resilience, or SICAR-PH. This project is the flagship program on climate and disaster resiliency of the Ateneo de Manila University and the Manila Observatory, together with the Ateneo Innovation Center and National Resilience Council. With relentless energy and enthusiasm, she works with physical and social scientists, DRRM officials and practitioners from partner cities, and experts from various fields and sectors to better the climate, disaster, and resilience landscape in the country. With Zikar PH, Dr. Porio continues to engage regional bodies such as the ASEAN Technical Advisory Group and the ASEAN Committee in Disaster Management, local government units from barangay officials to mayors, national government agencies, and the private sector to further bridge the science policy practice nexus by mobilizing climate and disaster science towards actionable programs for community resilience. She reiterates how important the three principles of transdisciplinary action research and the crafting of public-private partnerships for resilience are co-generation of knowledge with stakeholders, co-creation of capacities of resilient scientists and practitioners, and co-ownership or co-benefits among part. This year, she was bestowed the rank of Professor Emeritus along with Father Bienvenido Nebres and Father Adolfo de Canay. A game changer in her field who is always pushing intellectual boundaries, a professor and mentor to students, young sociologists, and researchers, a respected colleague, and a devoted friend. 
Let us welcome Dr. Emma Porio, who will deliver an acts of Magis talk about reinventing climate and disaster research for community resilience under the COVID-19 lockdown. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Acts of Magis, Athenians in the Service of Society. If we were on Netflix, we would be on season two of Acts of Magis. Uh, definitely, there are a lot of good works that we'd like to share with you, and so we will keep on sharing these with you. So for the month of June, there are uh, a set of four uh, presentations that we will be giving to you through Acts of Magis, and we will start the first one with no less than Dr. Emma Porio. Okay. Good afternoon, Ma'am Emma. Good afternoon, Chris. How are you? How I'm good, ma'am. How are you? I can see your pearls are still in great shape. Well, it's my anting anting. <laughs> yes, yes, and it's nice to see that uh, you're you're up and healthy and definitely very busy, you know, despite uh, all the things happening. In fact, when we were having our online thesis defenses, when Emoy saw me with my pearls, she says, "Okay, na tayo. Pasok na ito si Emma with her pearls." <laughs> yes, and, and definitely you know, that, that's something we want for this <laughs> afternoon. Now, be, before we continue with, uh, well, or be, before we start rather with the presentation of Doc Emma, we'd like to request all our guests to please keep your microphones on mute and to kindly turn off your cameras for the duration of the presentation. And then later on during the question and answer portion, then you could join us also. Uh, we'd also like to thank, of course, those who had put Acts of Magis together, uh, in particular the University Research Council or URC and the Ateneo Research Institute of Science and Engineering or ARIDES for leading Acts of Magis. And I'd also like to thank all our partners and collaborators who work in the background to bring you Acts of Magis. We are coming to you live on two platforms. We are in a GMeet session where the guests may later on uh, Put in the chat some questions you might have for Doc Emma and her research. And we're also streaming live on the Atenea Facebook account, where you also may put any of your questions or comments through the comment sections. And if we can accommodate them, we will talk about them later during the end of the presentation. So, Doc Emma, are we ready? Yes, we are ready. Um, All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Emma Porio. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is June 5, 2020, World Environment Day. Let us thank the environments that have always supported us. My presentation, Reinventing Climate and Disaster Resilience Under the COVID-19 Lockdown, is my way of thanking the Ateneo de Manila University and all my leaders, administrators, and colleagues for the nurturing environment that they have always prevent, uh, provided me the past 30 years. As they say, on the shoulders of giants we stand. So I'm very grateful to the Office of the President, the University Research Council, the VP Loyola Schools, and the Office for Associate Dean for Research and Creative Work, the Ateneo Research Institute for Science and Engineering, the deans of the School of Social Sciences and the School of Science and Engineering, the chairs of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Department of Environmental Science, my colleagues at Ateneo Innovation Center, Manila Observatory, and my private sector partners at the National Resilience Council and the National Local Government Partners, and finally at the Arete, wherein I am a Sandbox Residences Fellow. My presentation will consist of three parts. The first part, I'll talk about the principles informing the Coastal Cities at Risk Project focuses on investing in climate and disaster resilience tools that are solutions driven with systems thinking lens and transitional action for community resilience. The second part, I will look at the re research outputs and applications, and I'll share with you our initiatives of building the capacities of local governments in doing climate disaster risk assessment with the Manila Observatory and the National Resilience Council, in the same manner, the testing of the city and barangay resilience scorecards with the National Resilience Council and the tools and technologies for resilience produced by the Manila Observatory and the 
School of Science and Engineering and Athenaeum Innovation Center. The third, I will talk about the resilience innovations that we recalibrated because of the COVID lockdown. For the last two months, we basically re-engineered ourselves that internally, we will focus on producing digital and online products that will result in the resilience toolkit for the Philippines. Externally, we are basically focusing on two major initiatives. We supported the AIC's fabricating of disaster resilience technologies like the low-cost ventilator and the portable digital library alongside with the clean water systems. We are also currently now, I think um, my partners at National Resilience Council and Epimetrics and uh, Xavier University and the Cagayan de Oro local government, we are supporting the dashboard for COVID risk management. It's that's really a climate disaster risk assessment map overlaid with an epidemiological layer. And this is in partnership with the NRC, the Epimetrics, Dr. Wong, our health specialist in the CICAR page the Xavier University and the local governments of Naga, Iloilo, and Muntinglupa, which are our SICAR partner cities. Now let me introduce to you the research team. I'm very honored. In my old age, I consider it basically my privilege to work with these brilliant men and women who are committed to building resilience in our cities and in our country. So we have Father Jet as our project holder and very uh, thankful to him, my co-principal investigators, Jack Versilia and Tony Yolo Loisaga, our council of advisors, um, headed by Ostia Panadero of the Swilig Foundation, uh, Dr. Caraos of the Ateneo de Manila, and Sly Boramida of the local government unit of San Juan. Um, we have also our pool of, research, of experts, <coughs> uh, headed by C.P. David and other experts from other departments and schools. We also have our work theme leaders, Dr. Narisma and his team at the Manila Observatory, uh, Dr. Gutanko and um, Dr. Clarete in the work package too on producing tools and technologies. We also are very fortunate to have Dr. Wong on looking at the impacts of climate on leptos and dengue. And we have Dr. Ravago of uh, the Department of Economics looking at the impacts, the climate impacts of informal and informal economy. We're also very privileged to have uh, Dr. Clarete and Dr. Juanio doing com computer equilibrium model and really looking at the hazard impacts on the, on the economy. We are also fortunate to have at the Ateneo Innovation Center, Greg Tagon and his team with Dr. Libatiki, Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Libatiki and, and um, engineer Toto Opus and Paul Kabakongan, of course, our champion for low cost technologies for the local communities. We also have for our work package team, we have of course, Tony Yolo, Yolo Loisaga and Toby David heading and, heading the work package tree on applications. And also we have our partners in Naga, in Iloilo, and in Montinglupa, in Pasig, and in Valenzuela. So why do we need to reinvent our work and engagements now in the time of COVID-19? Two days ago, on June 3, BBC News says, Cyclone Nisarga, storm set to hit COVID-19 ravaged Mumbai. Mumbai has 20 million population, more or less like Metro Manila, but it has 50,000 cases of COVID in infected patients who, are, who share uh, hospital beds and these have to be evacuated. The heavy rains and storms usually bring illnesses associated with gastrointestinal diseases, dengue and leptospiruses. This situation highlights the vulnerabilities of health and governance systems and of the poor. Another headline three days ago says, coronavirus complicates preparation for a typhoon season in Japan. Certainly with the floods and rains, evacuation becomes complicated with the social distancing and also uh, all the other precautions because of the COVID um, risk. This is a case wherein I'd say 
biological hazards, which is the coronavirus, it collides with climate hazards, and this results into cascading disasters. This is a perfect combination of really everything becoming so challenged. So I let me go back now to Metro Manila, which is the epicenter of the COVID infection in the Philippines. By itself, Metro Manila is also very challenged in terms of climate change, pollution, traffic. It, Metro Manila is the number three of the cities with the lowest quality of life. So what do we need then in this situation? We really need urgent frameworks for strategic action that are solutions driven, systems oriented, and in approach, it is transdisciplinary. In our work as scientists and practitioners, we must always keep in mind that we are only one, one actor in a series of actors trying to search for solutions within these different systems. So we also need tools and technologies that are consumable, they're actionable. It can be used by people on the ground and it can benefit the people who really need it most. We also need, I would say, a community of scientists and that really are serious in producing uh, scientific findings and technologies that is useful for society. And we can do this through public-private partnerships for resilience, and I will illustrate it through SICAR. So I've already talked about how we should think as, uh, and utilize as of a systems approach to analyzing our cities, our governments, our private sector, civil society organizations, and the communities who are at risk to climate disasters. We need to support our cities really in terms of building or achieving their capacities for resilience. We have to build tools such that it can guide the city to uh, prepare, adapt, and transform. And we should basically, we have to make investments for cities to have resilience. We have to invest in organizational competences, livelihood, and infrastructural capacities so that the systems, the urban systems, can really prepare, adapt, and transform towards resilience. And we should look at risk governance and their capacities at multi scalar, multi level level so that we can reduce the risks and promote resilience investments. We believe in SICAR that investments in risk reduction ex ante through a risk-informed resilience-driven planning and development is very important. As we say, an owens of prevention equals a pound of cure. If you see here in the table, the top 15 countries with the highest exposure worldwide, number three is Philippines, number four is Japan. But when you look at the 15 countries with the highest vulnerability worldwide, neither Philippines or Japan are there. But then when you look at countries with the highest risk worldwide, Philippines is there, there number three, but Japan is now number 17. So what makes the difference? Uh, the difference really is in investments, the investments in risk reduction and resilience driven planning and development. In SICAR, we basically subscribe to what I call intersectional approach. We have to analyze the intersection of exposure, vulnerability, adaptation, and resilience of our cities. We have to consider the social, geophysical, and sociocultural drivers of risks, and we have to analyze them at the different levels of macro, meso, and micro levels at the community. So by combining these approaches, we are able to come up with a very strategic risk profile, and we will guide us to our investments on reducing the risks this is different systems uh, are subjected to. This is an example of um, what I mean about intersection analysis. The scientists at the Manila Observatory mapped out the Metro Manila River Elevation Index and the flooded areas. And if you look there, there are, there are dots there. Those are the 18 urban poor communities that I surveyed in the four um, and the three 
flood basins. So um, our sample areas, it covers the Kamanaba for coastal, uh, for coastal um, areas, Makati for inland alluvial, Quezon City for inland alluvial, and Marikina Pasig headwaters for alluvial. As you can see there, you will see the geophysical vulnerabilities and exposure of the city. At the same time, you have to look at Metro Manila. Metro Manila has an official population of 15 million, and, but the daytime population can run up to 18 to 20 million, and Mega Manila has 25 million. The informality level of Metro Manila is around 45 to 60 percent, and the population density is about 20,000 per square kilometer. And Metro Manila enjoys urban economic primacy. We have the 37 percent of the GDP is here produced. And in terms of governance system, we have a decentralized form with the 17 cities and municipality, but we only we have the Metro Manila Development Authority to basically look at, at semblance of metropolitan governance. So certainly in terms of risk governance, we're a little bit challenged there in terms of really when you look at it, floods and storms really do not know any political administrative boundaries. They're ecological. So we have to look at our risk governance systems such that it can be harmonized and basically um, act together. So. This is the work package team of Dr. Narisma at the Manila Observatory. Uh, they identify the climate and disaster risk across time and space, while at the School of Social Sciences, I'm looking at the exposure and vulnerability across time, across major st stakeholders. So the climate science at the Manila Observatory, and you can see here that over time, the Metro Manila has been evolving in terms of exposure and risk. You will see from 1999 up to 2018, you can see the dots, the red dots are the areas wherein it's occupied by informal settlers. But you can see in 2018 that the city has become sort of monochromatic in terms of the distribution of informal settlements and mixed settlements, because a lot of the informal uh, settlers have to have their place of work near the city. And also another product of us the SICAR page, uh, Dr. Wong and Dr. Rabago also look at the climate impacts to health and the formal economy. As shown here, really, the poor really suffer most in terms of losing of li li livelihood during during typhoons and flooding. Also in terms of incidence of dengue and leptospirosis, the accumulated uh, incidence really is centered on the urban poor settlements. Another study that we also looked at is really about air pollution. As we develop, as we progress, so to speak, we're also increasing pollution of our city. And in fact, uh, Dr. Kambalisa and Dr. Gutanko and Dr. Sempas and Dr. Wong, we made a study in at Katipunan, and I always say, hidden disaster. Air pollution is a hidden disaster. Pollutants in our midst are killing us softly. We cannot see it, so we don't recognize the risk. So in fact, our studies show with the uh, jeepney drivers, frontliners. By the way, I am mentioning here so many scientists you can Google their works at Ateneo Archeum. Uh, I don't have time to discuss about their works, but go to the Ateneo Archeum and you will see all these studies of this brilliant scientist in our midst. So for example, our study on the exposure of the street-based populations and the jeepney drivers and the flat riders, they don't recognize that the air around them is contributing to their low quality of life and also shortening their life and also to their illnesses. In fact, the taxi driver, the, the jeepney drivers, when they were presented with the results by Dr. Wong and Dr. Kendra Gutanko, Dr. Kambalesa, they were told that, you know, their blood pressure, their palpitation, their respiratory illness are this level. They basically just said, 
oh, normal lang yon, you know, that's part of the hazard of being a jeepney driver. But they were more afraid and they will be more worried of the displacement of their livelihood of the incoming jeepney modernization system. And in fact, now under the COVID regime, it seems like, you know, the, the suffering of the jeepney drivers is now much more highlighted. Another um, work that really I'm very proud of is the work of the economist and the systems dynamic thing, um, analyst at the Environmental Science of Peru Campo. They have, produced, they have produced the Urban Ecosystem Resilience Index as well as the City Resilience Toolkit. Uh, Dr. Clarete and his team with Dr. Tuanyo have also innovated in terms of um, modeling the computer generated equilibrium model, basically looking at how the city will, we can estimate the losses and damages from shocks of flood and typhoon and the like. And it's very important work. Now, how did we translate these inputs at the local level? In partnership with the climate and disaster risk assessment team at the Manila Observatory and the National Resilience Council, we produced risk profile and for its partner city and also with uh, the local governments. And we basically think it should be in, in, inputted into the local developments. So how do we translate? Far, as far as we're concerned in the SICAR PH, we link climate science to policy and practice by producing the science and characterizing the risk, contextualizing the vulnerability and capacity, and developing tools uh, for systems thinking. And we basically, work um, with the local partners in trying to translate them into um, risk profiling and climate as a risk recent maps and hopefully become an input. If you can see here, you will see that our, in, our analysis really will go into the local planning development process if we hope that our climate disaster risk assessment and our risk profiling is being used to update local climate adaptation plans. Also basically to test the resilience scorecards, I'll talk about it later at the city and barangay level. And basically it should determine and change the annual investment plan of the city so that we basically direct the investments towards risk reduction and resilience driven in the orientation. So this is the resilience model that is basically innovated by the National Resilience Council. If you see there, it looks at the five elements of a resilient LGU, leadership and governance, human development, sustainable local economy, infrastructure, environmental sustainability. If we attend to all of this in the preparation stage and adapt stage and transform stage, you should be able to have resilient LGUs that are able to reduce the damage of properties and infra and agriculture. And it should, there should be development continuity after every storm, flooding, or, or whatever disasters you'll have. We also uh, believe that we should move science to action with multiple stakeholders by co-generating the knowledge, co-creation the capacities, and in the process of doing so, you will enjoy, you will own the benefits and the product as well. So we did this in the integrated uh, risk assessment planning in the participant community risk assessment that we did in Muntinglopa and some other communities, and also testing resilience scorecards in the barangay. Resilience scorecards with the cities of Naga, Iloilo, Muntinglopa, and several others in partnership with Ateneo de Naga, uh, University of the Philippines of Visayas and Pamantasan and Nusud na Manila. You can see here uh, our partners in the local government and academic partners. Uh, in Munting Lupa, we basically partnered with uh, uh, DOST on the use of Hazard Hunter. So you can see we applied it to Munting Lupa. Um, we, we can see the Munting Lupa City baseline scorecard here. Red means in the prepare phase, you are not ready, but yellow means you have adapted and green more or less, you have transformed your structures so that it can become resilient. Uh, this is an adaptation of the resilience scorecard 
uh, Tony Yololoy Saga will, can be credited with really creating the Barangay Resilience Scorecard, the spot turned after the bingo. And our work with local officials at the barangay level, they like it. You know, it's like bingo. You, you, you score, you assess the resilience levels of your barangay according to those uh, indicators that were presented earlier in terms of human development, of local economy, infrastructure and development and ecology. And they like it, you know, you have red or yellow and green. And this is an example of one barangay in Montinglupa. Uh, we also use the DOC Hazard Hunter uh, in terms of doing participatory community risk assessment. And here you can see the map validation and enhancement. Um, and all of this will go into the input into the Resilient Local Government Unit Program. And in this case, we are looking at Maming Lupa. We think that to move towards resilience, it has a way of whole of society approach. It involves a local government in partnership with civil society organizations, with the community, uh, with the communities and the academic partners and the private sector. Uh, we basically believe that we, sh we should move towards an integrated multiscalar approaches to risk governance and resilience. There should be coherence and structural and non-structural measures of adaptation within and between sectors across time and space. Resilience frameworks designed to address dynamic interactions between sectors and scales and along different decision-making levels. Therefore, I always tell my classes, gender, generation, and social geographies, three Gs that will tell you whether your approach is really benefiting those three groups, women, children, elderly, children, and the people who are marginalized are able to um, benefit from all the uh, from all the input. So, for example, we look at the annual investment plans of the local government and the barangay. Where are the investments for health, for social protection, uh, and the like? So that is where you can see whether you're invest. You're, are you investing on building the capacities of those who are? Um, marginalized and of the society and therefore we should make sure that the distribution of resources should be privileged towards that sector. So now let me move on to the last part of my presentation which is reinventing resilience innovations under the COVID-19 lockdown. We basically, uh, I will, I have mentioned that earlier about publication and testing of technologies. The locust ventilator is really um, driven by the fact that in the COVID infection, now there's a shortage of ventilators. And then the near cloud technologies, which is like a portable digital library, is really that we are every, everything now we're going online. The portable digital library, the near cloud system, will assist the, uh, the schools and households who don't have access to stable internet. Uh, we also co-organize uh, co webinars with the National Resilience Council. And then we are working now with the National Resilience Council in creating a dash a training in creating a dashboard for COVID risk management platform. So this is um, our, I would say this is our major contribution to the webinar on resilient recovery, the most vulnerable. We found out really that if you look at the current distribution of the special assistance program, the list of, of people who are supposed to get it is really very limited. It does not cover all the people who are vulnerable and have lost their jobs, like those in the informal sector. So I think Jean Carraos made a pretty well good argument that in the current uh, distribution of the staff, the informal vulnerable groups are actually invisible. Also in the, in the Philippine Statistical Authority, statistically, they are not there. So it's, they're invisible and um, government is also blind in statistics of uh, statistically speaking. Um, then we have the, um, the innovation I mentioned earlier about the clean, wa the clean water systems of the Atenea Innovation Center have been established in Valenzuela, in Buclodtao and San Mateo, and also in post-earthquake post uh, situations in Cotabato and many other places. And the clean water systems is very much needed, especially after a flood, 
were in water is really so important for the, those in the informal settlements and the poor who don't have access to clean water systems. Um, and of course, I mentioned earlier about the heat index monitoring module that we are doing in Pasig, as well as in Metro Manila. Um, we find that, you know, um, whether it's very hot, like now with the summer, it really affects the, the indoor and outdoor heat index affects the behavior of people and also it affects really our how we can do our activities. As you can see, you know, work productivity uh, is really affected. So we're doing that heat index monitoring module with the Ateneo Innovation Center. And then you can see Paul Kabakongan there fabricating and testing the low cost ventilator. And we hope, you know, that would really at this point, I'd like to thank Dr. Eddie Dorotan who helped me or the Kalingpo to link us to the hospital in Marikina to test uh, the fabricated model. Uh, I've talked about the near cloud system, which is good for our online life now. Uh, this is like a digital portable library that can be useful for those schools who don't have access to internet. And last uh, but not the least, I'm putting here the cocoa yogurt recipe. If you notice in the May 15 presentation of Dr. Toby Dairit on VCO as a good way to strengthen our immune system against the COVID infection, I really took note that he said, you don't have to take VCO, you can take coconut meat, fresh coconut milk. And Greg has been promoting this cocoa yogurt recipe wherein you can strengthen your immune system by just taking cocoa yogurt if you cannot take VCO. So now these are last innovation that I was talking about this, the geospatial risk database of COVID-19, and we're still um, formulating this with the National Resilience Council and, uh, and the Epimetrics, which is our major partner, or the major, and, and we are supposed to start the training in partnership with Xavier University. The partners, the NRC cities of Eriga, CDO, and Zambonga and Omok. Okay, so let me basically say that we are really convinced that we have to produce science in the service of the nation. Science and technology in the service of the nation. And you can see this in the observatory provide typhoon advisories in the Taal volcano eruption. The team of Dr. Kambalisa and Simpas, you know, produced uh, analysis of the air quality during the Taal eruption. And also we have made um, campaigns at the UN bodies in terms of how University climate action through transfer research and in research should really be, be supported and we should advance it. And you can see here our presentation, uh, the UNUHS panel was very highly acclaimed because of our presentation as far as it is an example of how university climate ambitions can be advanced. So here you can visit us on our website WW Observatory, the Resilience, website, Resilience Council website, the Coastal Cities at Risk website. We also have a Facebook. And we basically, you, you uh, most of these presentations, actually you can see in our website and also in our newsletters. And I'll bring back again to the brilliant men and women whom I'm very privileged to work with. And um, we basically would like to close that Constructing human security and resilience can be done through a positively responsive community of scientists, policymakers, and practitioners. And I like this quote by the Jewish philosopher Yehoda Berg. He says, a true community is not just about being geographically close to someone or part of the same social web network. It's about feeling connected and responsible for what happens. Humanity is our ultimate community, and everyone must contribute to its positive development. And I must say, thank you for your support in building our common home. And Father Jet also says, you must care for some space that belongs to everyone, where everyone must enjoy its benefits and goods. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doc Emma. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if, if our if we had our audience members with us right now, they'd be giving you a warm round of applause. Uh, in the meantime, we'd like to give you hearts. All right, I hope you can see the hearts. Okay, okay. 
that is coming for <laughs> your audience. So at this point, we'd like to invite those who are in the chat room to post your questions through the chat box, right? And we'll also get some, some questions that may have been forwarded through the FB stream. You know? uh, but we'd also like to make an, a quick apology. I think there were some glitches with the streaming on FB. Again, these are the, the adventures of live uh, sessions. You know? But if there's one thing I learned from Doc Emma, these challenges will not deter us from doing what has to be done. Tama po ba, Doc Emma? We must continue working. It's our only hope. Yes. To persist. That's right. And to insist. Yes, yes. <laughs> all right, to all right. Persist and insist that we have to. <laughs> to persist to and insist. All right, all right. So, ma'am, we I was able to gather some questions, all right, and I, I'd like to share them with you, and perhaps again. Uh, the, uh, our friends who are in the chat room could also add to this. Uh, clearly, the, the work you do is, is, is very important. Huh? And at the, at the end of it, it has, it's the LGU that has to act on them. And the right? community. And, and the community. The, the, LGU, uh, the LGU and the community. Huh? Um, but how do you have these of dealing with these different institutions now so there's the lgu the national government even the private sector and then even perhaps the academic sector no? so how do you deal with all the complexities you have to be focused and you have to have faith and confidence in the capacity of each we strengthen each other we maximize the strength of the other and support their weaknesses so i would say that collegial partnership collaborative partnership I think trust, I always, in my experience, is that we work with trust that the other can help us move towards a direction that we want to be. So, yeah, it's complicated and it's a lot of work, but I would say that for us, for our science and our technologies to be really useful, we have to, you know, move towards abrazo, you know, you, you have to cap it busy. We, no one left behind. We have yes, to be together. Yes. As I always say, this, as Pope Francis says, this is our only home. So we must invest everything to make it better. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Doc Emma. And then um, offhand, it, it's a big team that you've been working with. No? Uh, and I, I think the work continues even though the COVID uh, pandemic had hit us and all of that. How is the team doing right now? Oh, the team is very busy. I think sometimes they think I'm such a hard taskmaster. That's why at this point I would say, whoever is listening now, know that you know I believe in your capacity to do. You know they are producing so many things. That's why I said, Google their works at the Ateneo Archeum, and really I would say, it's it's simply because I think. I like working with them because they are very good in their work. And also, I really think that we have to look at it as a community, that we are in this together, and that our commitments for scholarship is also much with our commitments for a better world. I'm looking at the chat also. 